true science is a cross-cultural response to the lack of diversity in STEM fields. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Oops, pushing too many buttons. <laughs> Rock True Science is designed to serve the intellectual need of fallen man while serving the desire for interdependence to better understand our physical world while still, still pursuing spiritual growth. Rock True Science seeks to inspire, enlighten, and highlight upcoming and established kings and queens of STEM fields while promoting black consciousness and awareness of who we are and to whom we belong. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Sorry, I'm trying to, uh, I'm, I'm producing and talking at the same time. So it like threw my train of thought off. So <laughs> we learning, we learning. Okay, I'm trying to see how do we, here we'll do that. There we go, okay. See, pushing all the buttons and not, not pushing the right buttons. Here, let me see if I can get my light a little bit better up in here because it looked like I'm sitting in the dark and I'm definitely not. This lamp is on this last little, <laughs> this lamp is on this last little go around. All right. So today we are continuing on with our transition metals conversation talk information all right and so um this is definitely going to oops. here we're gonna mute that that's me sharing it <laughs> like you heard me I was like yeah that's me i'm sharing it and and i ended up closing the video okay there we go so doo -doo. There we go. So today we have a couple of interesting elements to talk about. So um, we have manganese, iron, cobalt, technetium. I think I'm pronouncing that correct correctly. Technetium, technetium, technetium. I'm not sure. I guess both. It depends on you know what you're more partial to. Um, ruthenium. And do I have rhodium on here? Yes, and rhodium. Did I have ruthenium? Yep. Oh, I think I wrote down the wrong. We'll get to that. We'll we'll get we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay, so we're gonna start off with manganese. Now, uh, the word manganese is actually from uh, the Greek kingdom of magnesia. And so mag uh, manganese actually has a, a, a pretty um, muddy, I would say, uh, muddy naming history. So, um, hey, yes, good evening. So, um, Magnes was actually two different minerals. So, magnetite and pyrolusite makes up uh, the two different minerals that was a part of this magnes that was originally discovered. So they don't have like a, a specific like discovery time because this is one of those elements that's just, it's just kind of always been around. People just kind of always knew it was there and, you know, worked with it and did stuff with it. So there's no one person or time that can be accredited to discovering and naming this element. It just had a name that kind of just stuck with it and it continued on from, you know, from there. And so the pyrolusite um, mineral is a uh, manganese O2. It's a, it's a manganese oxide. And um, that one was actually called magnesia. I'm not sure if that's the same milk of like milk of magnesia. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We can, we can look it up. <laughs> Let's see. What's the milk of magnesia? What's in it? What it do? Let's see what's in it. Um, oh, here we go. Ingredients. Yeah. Magnesium hydroxide. So no, that is not the same as the one that gets your stomach together when you uh constipated and all. Oh. <laughs> that's not that is not the same thing okay so don't go and be like oh yeah magnesium yeah you could just no don't just drink that um because yeah 
that's not the one. <laughs> but um, mag manganese was used to make clear glass because for some reason when glass was like first made, it had like a green tint to it. Like it probably would have like a light green tint, the thinner the glass got, but for the most part, glass was green. And so once they added manganese to the glass, it actually gave it a purple tint and the purple offset the green so you would end up with clear i know it's like it's kind of like a mind-blowing concept that you mix colors and you get clear but that's like the same thing that we did like when we make paint like white paint isn't actually just white paint it's not just white it actually has pigments in it there's different colors in it red yellow blue maybe some black different and it's different like shades of those colors like like a dark red like or like a deep mustard orange yellowish color like and and then you mix those colors in there and you get white paint like <laughs> that was but it, it trust me it, it makes a difference and it does affect like the gloss the shine how the light reflects off of it and stuff like that so it makes sense on a scientific level, but you have to like actually work with it to really like understand it on the first go around. So definitely dig into like color chemistry because I love color chemistry and uh, physics kind of, I think, touches on that because you have to um, understand light refraction. And we, we're going to get a little bit into that because we're going to talk about some of the instruments used uh, to, um, I would say probably to like study uh, some of these compounds and, and the crystals and things that they form. So we'll talk about that very, very uh, briefly, but we won't get too deep into that because I'm going to cover it in a little bit more depth when we start covering some physics topics because, yeah, physics is, is really heavy on the brain. But trust me, I would say that even though physics was like my hardest subject in school, it was definitely the most rewarding because it really helped me understand a lot more of the physical world around me and how I interact with it. And I could even like kind of eyeball how things would go, like the trajectory and stuff, like, and all that stuff. So it was easier for me to kind of manipulate my body's motion in the world. And like, it, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a, it's a, like a clarifying lens, I would say, on how you view the world and interact with it. So we, we're definitely going to get into some physics topics to the depth of my knowledge of it, because I wasn't that great at it. And it, takes a lot of calculus and trust me we're not doing none of those calculations so don't worry <laughs> don't even don't even start sweating if we are not doing any of those calculations we're gonna do the fun physics okay so manganese um was actually called uh by the glass makers they called it glass maker soap because of this property where it turned uh it basically cleaned the glass from green to clear um, it's also used in steel production to fix the sulfur that's found in iron ores. So iron ores tend to have sulfur in it because sulfur is in the same group as oxygen. Remember when we talked about oxygen? Sulfur is right under oxygen, so it has very similar chemical properties as oxygen. And so it forms iron sulfides very readily with iron, especially naturally occurring iron as found in iron ores. So to remove, so when it says to fix, it means to basically grab, pull, and, you know, remove the sulfur from the iron. And um, it does that. So manganese sulfide is, uh, is a thing. It's definitely a thing. And um, because transition metals readily form oxides. And like I said, sulfur is an oxide, uh, reacting type uh, atom because it has similar properties to oxygen being in the same periodic group. And in this instance, when manganese is added to uh, iron or to steel in steel production, it strengthens the steel and it prevents oxidation, which basically means it prevents resting. <laughs> so it keeps it from resting. It has kind of the uh, similar, like if, if you've noticed, there's a trend with a lot of these steel and metal alloys and metals and things that are added to these uh, metal alloys is mostly that they prevent them from wear and tear. And so that's like the, excuse me, the front end of those type of uh, chemical and engineering developments in metal uh, in metallurgy. I think that's called metallurgy. Like, you know, the, the making and um, 
engineering of metals uh, is to extend its durability, extend its use, and increases strength in different um, settings. So increases strength under high temperature and increases strength under high pressure as well. So um, naturally, if they're adding it to metals, th those are the properties it's going to add to it. And manganese is one of those that does that. So guess what? It's not only found in metal alloys, it is also a very important mineral in our bodies. So um, it's found in enzymes. So uh, it's, it's necessary for vitamin B12 um, production and um, in use. So if, if you're having low energy, you probably might be missing some essential minerals in your body, in your diet. Um, a lot of a lot of the trace uh, they call them trace elements or trace minerals that are essential to our um, biological functioning can more than likely be found in fruits and vegetables. Yes, fruits, vegetable, and uh, fish. So marine and freshwater, depending on the you know the mineral it is that you're looking for. Marine animals tend to have more of these uh, these transition metals in them because these are readily dissolved in seawater because of the salts and things. So the salts tend to make very uh, easy compounds with these transition metals due to oxidation states and things like that. So like I said, we're, we're not going to get into like the, the calculations of that and the concentrations and things like that. But in very, uh, in very small amounts, they, they're useful. But and once they exceed those amounts, that's when they become toxic, um, especially to the marine animals. They actually can prevent um, reproduction. They can prevent um, eggs from hatching. They can prevent the, um, the fish from being able to absorb oxygen out of the water through their gills. It can cause all types of problems. So imagine that it doing it to them. They're biological species. So we're biological species as well. So it can cause problems for us as well if they exceed useful levels. Um, and so um, manganese is not, uh, it's not stored anywhere in the body. So it is an essential mineral and you do have to ingest it uh, daily. It's in very, like very small amounts. Like I said, if you, if you have a balanced diet, you're more than likely getting enough of this mineral, especially if you eat your, you know, eating your vegetables, you're getting like a little bit of fish or something in there, um, you know, once or twice a week, then you're probably, you're probably good to go. So however long it takes for your body to digest fish and all of that stuff, it's probably about how long you have the manganese in your body. So, um, make sure, make sure, <laughs> balanced diet, very important. And it is important in the processes that form bones, clots your blood, and regulates blood sugar. So this is a, a key component in um, like our life. <laughs> so you you it's very important to um for the prevention of diabetes to have healthy levels of manganese in your body. And um, also if you if you're on like blood thinners and things like that, like you want to make sure that you're getting your recommended daily value of uh, manganese because if you're on a blood thinner, then you could have issues with your blood clotting. Um, I believe that was all. Oh, yeah. And they're also used to metabolize fats and carbohydrates as well. So um, these are, well, the the enzymes that metabolize your fats and your carbohydrates uh, rely on your manganese supply. So I can't, I cannot stress this enough. The SAD, the standard American diet, which is high in saturated fats and processed carbs and sugars do not lend themselves to providing these type of nutrients that your body needs daily. Like your body doesn't make this stuff. It doesn't, as you can see, it doesn't even store it. So if you are not eating the things that contains this, you are not going to be able to build the things that require this. So there's no replacement for manganese in some of these cells. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta get it in there. So that's my soapbox for that. Now, 
Um, iron, everybody knows about iron, especially if you're anemic and it's like, oh, my, my, my blood iron low, my iron low. <laughs> that's, that's how, that's, that's like, I, I would say it's probably like the most common, um, reference that people have for iron. Like people know that iron is in your blood. I don't know how many people know that it actually, it's the actual key component of your blood cell. So the little, um, if you've ever seen a, a blood cell or a picture of one, it looks like a little donut. And the reason for that is because the iron, excuse, the iron atom is in the center of your blood cell. And then um, the iron attaches itself to these other, the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a blood protein, a red blood, blood cell protein. And it has these four heme groups, which are your globin and it makes four and it happens to make this donut shape. And so um, when those proteins are shaped and formed properly, it makes a nice little round donut shape. Now, if the proteins do not form correctly, you'll end up with a sickle shaped blood cell and that's where sickle cell comes from. So um, that is a genetic disorder. It is not something that you can catch nor uh, necessarily prevent through any type of external, you know, resource or cause other than knowing the person that you're having children with genetic uh, predisposition. So if you have the sickle cell trait, you will not have sickle cell symptoms because the trait does not mean that you have sickle cell disease or disorder. I'm not sure what they're calling it these days, but yes. So the only way to have sickle cell is to have two trait bearers come together and produce a child that now has the full uh, genetic um, disposition for that. And so the I, the word iron comes from the Anglo-Saxon iron, this I-R-E-N, and um, ferrum, so the, the F-E, so if, you, if you've seen the chemical symbol for iron is F-E, and it's like, why is it F-E and iron is spelled I-R-O-N? Because it stands for ferrum. So ferrum is Latin for firmness. And um, iron is another one of those things that's kind of just been around and been used, even if it wasn't like, you know, immediately called what we call it now. But um, the ancient Egyptian iron dates back to about 3500 B.C., and they also contain about 8% of nickel, suggesting that it came from a meteorite. So they weren't actually mining iron like how we do now. They probably just picked it up from rocks that they found on the surface of the earth that hit from meteors landing. So that's, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's just like, you know, I don't know if you, like as a kid, you went around looking for moon rocks. I, I grew up in California and that was definitely a thing we did, like walk around looking for moon rocks. I think it was like geodes and all kind of stuff. Like I was, yeah, I was definitely, I didn't have a pet rock, but I definitely had a rock collection and like they had the little, the geode, like the geode is basically, it's like a round little rock and it's got crystals all, all in it. And so then you, you crack the rock open and then that's when you get to see all the little crystals inside. And so, yeah, we, we got to do that once. I think it was like second grade or something when we did that. It was fine. But yeah, that's, that's me. See, I had a very early start with, <laughs> with my nerdage. So I've been a lifelong nerd and I will be. <laughs> and, um, so the iron age, so I, I know we've, if we've gone through high school, you've probably at some point come across the different ages, you know, the Bronze Age, Iron Age. So the Iron Age occurred um, around 1500 BC when the Hittites of Asia Minor started smelting iron ore to make tools and weapons. And so, like I said, the active part of hemoglobin, and we did we did talk about this in depth, and I showed you the picture of the blood cell and the heme groups and all that stuff. So you can't be like, oh, but we no, we definitely talked about this. So if you got to scroll back to the oxygen video, the oxygen group, and I, I believe it's called oxygen group, it's the oxygen group, okay? And we talk about that in depth on that one. So, but yeah, 
that's what iron does. That's like its most important function for us <laughs> outside of um, what I'm now about to talk about is steel. So it is the main component of steel. So pig iron has about three to 5% carbon in it. And um, it has varying amounts of silicon, uh, sulfur, phosphorus and manganese see you see how these you see how these groups the groups and groupings stay together like you know birds of a feather flock together what well, elements next to each other tend to hang out together too all right so and the pig iron is basically used to make other iron other iron alloys like steel and the this steel is referred to as carbon steel so the um the alloy steel that um, hold on, my daughter, she's trying to get in. My bad. She was trying. She she wants me to pop her some more popcorn. She got to wait. <laughs> so uh, the pig iron makes carbon steel because there's no other uh, metals like true metals in that um, in that um, steel. And then alloy steel are your chrome steel. So the ones that have chromium in it. Um, titanium and um there's another one i guess palladium or something like whatever the other metals are that normally go into like the real hard shiny bright beautiful you know platinum titanium those type of steels those are alloy steels and then um wrought iron only has a few tenths of a percent of carbon and is less fusible than pig iron. So fusible just basically means that you can't melt it down and mix it with other stuff very easily. So wrought iron is pretty much all iron, like all iron. That's why if you've seen like really, really old cemeteries or really, really old like churches and big buildings, and I think like castles and stuff like that, they tend, their metal fixtures and things tended to be wrought iron. And so now they're all green. <laughs> because iron oxidizes very readily in moisture, rain, the elements and things like that. So with it being pretty much all iron, there's no real way to protect the iron from oxidizing. And so it turns green. <laughs> and I, I don't know, maybe you suspected it, but <laughs> it's the fourth most abundant element so not metal is the fourth most abundant element in the Earth's crust and is also believed to be the main component of the Earth's core. I don't think they know that for sure. They kind of guessed it because of like the way our gravitational field is and the, you know, mass, of all of that stuff. So like they kind of make educated guesstimates based on very, very hard math that they did so see this that's why stem is such a very huge field because like you got like the theoretical side of stuff you got the practical side of stuff you got the applied you know side of stuff so like that would lie in the theoretical side of stuff where you watch like nova see i'm showing my nerd again because <laughs> i don't know if anybody else watched nova but i definitely was watching all the nova episodes on pbs before i think they separated from pbs now and so you can kind of get like into you know their stuff from a separate avenue because pbs isn't really a thing anymore i don't think like is it it probably is i haven't watched tv in a long time but it's it's one of those free public it's, that's what it stands for public broadcasting station so it's free always been free, always will be free. They had like the nice little, uh, when they would do the fundraising events, they would have like a day on like Sunday or something like that, where they would show like ballets and musicals and all kind of stuff. And, you know, to get people to watch the station and call in with their donations and stuff like that. So thank y'all for all them years for donating and keeping that station free. Cause I learned a whole lot from PBS, like a lot. <laughs> and I probably, I don't know. I probably wouldn't be a scientist now if I, if I didn't have PBS. So thank you for that. <laughs> but yeah, Nova, um, 
I think it's like another one. Barney was Bar- I think Barney might have started on PBS. I want to say it was because I watched Barney too. I, I was definitely on me some Barney. <laughs> Uh, and I think the Magic School Bus, like all of my favorite shows as a kid, definitely was on CB, uh, PBS. Um, Zoom, Wishbone, uh, The Big Comfy Couch, uh, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. Wasn't that on there? I feel, like, but I, I know, like PBS definitely had kept the lineup, especially when, yep, it's a Magic School Bus. Yep, definitely kept the lineup, especially when kids was out of school. They knew that, and they made sure that the programming matched up with like the the time of day when you know kids were normally would normally be in school. So we still got you know some enrichment going. So yeah, thank you PBS. Shout out, shout y'all out. All right. <laughs> And um, pure iron is chemically reactive. So, like I said, iron just hanging out by itself is going to grab whatever electrons is hanging around, and because of that, it can it can oxidize very easily. And so, it actually has it actually has a very wide range of oxidation states. So, from a plus six oxidation state, like we expect most metals to have, to a negative two oxidation state, which is kind of uncharacteristic of metals because metals tend to only lose electrons not necessarily gain an overabundant amount of them so that being said that is why iron is very very reactive because it can it can be either or what they call um amphoteric is um what they call acids and bases or now it's solutions that can be acidic and basic you know depending on whatever so yeah that 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 would be that type of concept applied to that. I'm not sure what that name would be for um for you know metals. I'm gonna have to look that up. And then it has four allotropes. So remember, allotropes are something that is is basically the thing. So it's the element. It is not a different um you know thing. It is the same. It's Hey, right. Iron sharpens iron. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Marley King. <laughs> so allotropes are, you know, the element and it just has different forms of it. It's physical state. So like how the allotropes of carbon is um, diamond, graphite, and I can't remember that other one, but it's the one that makes the little nanotubes. It's, it's like right on the tip of my tongue. It'll come to me. But those are allotropes. So all of those are the element of carbon. So it's not a carbon with oxygen or with nitrogen. It's all just carbon. So the allotropes of iron, these are all just iron, and they just have different structures. So there's alpha, alpha ferrites, beta ferrites, gamma ferrites, and delta ferrites. And the interesting thing about the alpha and the beta ferrites is that alpha ferrites are magnetic. And then somehow once it shifts to the beta form, it's no longer magnetic. So magnetism is based on the directions that the electrons within the substance or solid or whatever the thing is are facing. So when something is magnetic, all of those electrons need to be facing in the same direction. And uh, what they call paramagnetic is when they face in one direction and they face in, they have one set that faces that and another set that faces in the opposite direction. And so they cancel each other out. So there isn't like a strong pull, but they can be forced to become magnetic if they're put in a strong enough magnetic field. So that's what paramagnetism is. So completely non-magnetic means that those electrons do not shift direction, they don't change, and they are not going to be pulled by a magnetic field, by an external magnetic field. And, you know, iron is basically like the magnetic standard because that's what most magnets are made out of because that's the whole, you know, the whole basis of magnetism was founded on iron and its magnetic property. So go figure it. There's actually a non-magnetic form of, of iron. Girl, you, don't, you didn't put the popcorn in your hair. Okay. <laughs> 
And the most common iron ore is hematite. And hematite is kind of pretty. It almost looks like uh, like shiny, shiny silver, like a shiny dark silver. I don't know if you've seen like pencil lead. It almost looks like pencil lead. Like that's what it looks like to me anyway. And um, it's mostly Fe2O3. So that's the chemical makeup of hematite. It's the iron oxide and it's mostly iron three oxygen. So it's the plus three oxidation state of iron. Yeah. Now that that's that's her busy laugh. Like she knows she doing something. She yeah. And so she that's her trying to be cute and like, no, nah, just calm down. You ain't gotta be. <laughs> I be on her. I know her tactics. She's trying to get other people with the cute face. That that don't work on me. <laughs> and um also magnetite which is um, an iron four oxide. So it's Fe3O4. Let that be iron four. I don't know. I might have to, I might have to uh, pencil that out and determine that. Because the oxidation states, the way they, the way they run. So oxygen, um, especially with these transition metals, the transition metals, like I said, they tend to have a bunch of oxidation states. So unless they're bound to something, you don't really know what their oxidation state is. So there are certain um, other elements that always have the same oxidation state. Like our, you know, our trusty first row elements tend to have that same oxidation state. So uh, oxygen almost always has an, uh, two negative oxidation state. And um, I feel like in this magnetite, it actually has its very, uh, it's slightly uncommon three minus oxidation state, which is different. But yeah, so that I'm assuming that's what that's what that one is. And then, <laughs> okay, when I saw this, this made me laugh because it's Taco Tuesday, and this one is called Taco Night. It's not Taco Night. I, it's probably not Taco Night, but I'm pronouncing it Taco Night because it's Taco Tuesday. <laughs> But it's spelled exactly like Taco Night, except it's N I T E because you know that's that's how ors are spelled. But yeah, so I just extra like nerded out with like a real bad <laughs> nerd job. <job>. But <laughs> so this one is actually a sedimentary rock containing more than fifteen percent iron mixed with uh, quartz. And so in this is in this instance. Um, especially with these, uh, with the, not the allotropes, maybe the allotropes and these iron ores, the way they would determine the, the differences in them and their structures and all of that good stuff is they would probably use, um, an instrument that does x-ray crystallography. And so x-ray crystallography is basically charting, like, it, like crystallography literally means graphing a crystal so you are charting the internal structure crystalline structure of a crystal using x-rays and so what happens is the x-rays shoot into the crystal and however the crystalline structure is set up is going to refract the light and is going to come out at a different angle depending on how those things are stacked together a computer now <laughs> does the very difficult math and it tells you what the structure is and like the base crystalline cube, uh, cubic structure. So it's like what it does is it takes a cube frame of some, you know, regular portion of the crystal and based on the stacking inside of that uh, 3D cube, um, you know, axes, it tells you, okay, this is the, you know, the makeup. So these many iron atoms uh, are stacked with this many oxygen atoms. And this is the, you know, and it might give two or three different possible crystalline, you know, configurations based on those, uh, those number of atoms uh, in that, that cubic block of space. Now, the thing with that is, is that's also how you find out if there are impurities or uh, inclusions, so impurities are basically other elements um, that are, you know, 
that end up getting stuck in the crystalline structure. So iron has a certain size, oxygen has a certain size. So smaller elements can end up wedging themselves down in the spaces in between those. And um, that would be an inclusion and um, an impurity. And so an inclusion would be like if the crystal got dropped and it got a ding in it or one of the, the iron oxide, uh, you know, building blocks got knocked out of it. And so now there's a hole or a gap that would be an inclusion. And so that's how uh, the people who, you know, grade and, and rate diamonds and things like that. That's how they, you know, go about doing that. And um, yeah, they use all those fancy terms just to say, it's some other stuff in your diamond. That's why it's not, you know, clear. Or <laughs> you banged your diamond up or it got nicked the wrong way. And so now it's all, you know, scratchy and cut up. Like that's all that, that's all they're saying. It's, it's nothing special. <laughs> And then iron is an essential mineral for our health, but too much is toxic because, here we go, it's still a metal. <laughs> it is still a metal, all right? And uh, free iron roaming around in your blood is bad because it can cause free radicals and um, oxidation, um, especially when it starts interacting with the peroxides and stuff in our blood. And um, it can cause, you know, damage to other cellular components because, you know, now it's popping off with all these, you know, random um, free radicals and, you know, iron oxides and stuff that don't belong that we can't use and all that other stuff. So it can cause problems and it can even cause like proteins to either misshape or unfold and everything in your body is based on, and when you think protein, I know like immediately in people's mind, they see like a chicken breast. That's not the protein I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't mean like meat protein. I don't even mean like necessarily not even just your muscle protein because those are actually tissues. So the proteins that make up your tissues, you don't actually see those. You see the big multi multicellular uh, higher level uh, conglomeration of those proteins. The proteins I'm talking about are amino acid chains. Look, the, the the visual representation are little just little beads. It almost looks like a be like a beaded necklace. Like you know how like you you get uh, I don't know if if you're a girl or like if you're not a girl, you probably seen like your cousins or sisters or something. But I had one of these sets where it had like all the different beads. It had the letter beads. You can make your bracelet. Like think of that. That's the protein chain. If you put it in that set, that's exactly what a protein chain is. It's essentially you uh um coding for certain things you want your name to be in the b you want your favorite colors to be on there it might have like your favorite like little charm or something knickknack on there and then boom now you got your friendship bracelet so oh you got a friendship bracelet oh and then you got a best friend bracelet and then you got your sister's bracelet and you got your so that that's what proteins are they're different chains used for different things and they're appropriate in different situations now imagine someone comes along with some scissors while you sleeping and snip your uh your bracelet off, you're gonna have a problem then, right? Because you you wasn't trying to you wasn't trying to take your bracelet off and it already had like a little, you know, a little thing that would loosen up and you could slide it off anyway without breaking it. So that's what the iron oxides come through and do. They jack your proteins up when you don't need them to be messed up, and then now you got a problem. And also free radicals from you know basic general cellular processes and things so all that stuff is always floating around in our body anyway which is why you got to get your antioxidants in okay oxides have problems when they you know go through their cellular stuff create free radicals which are you know just usually like loose electrons just running around doing you know stuff that they're not supposed to be doing and the antioxidants come in and you know settle them down they put it like a good disney movie or something on and, and give them snacks so <laughs> that's what antioxidants are for and you can usually find them in you guessed it fresh fruits and vegetables okay so fresh also includes frozen so frozen vegetables are good. I always recommend those over the can stuff because like to me, like the canning process tends to um, change the nutrition content of vegetables, especially certain types of vegetables. Like I wouldn't know that off the top of my head. I would definitely have to look it up. 
but I do. And that's why it takes me so long to grocery shop sometimes <laughs> because I'm standing in the aisle looking stuff up, like which is better to get, like, should I get this canned or frozen or fresh? Like I really, I really go through that, t- that level of like checking. And then eventually I do it enough. I don't have to check my phone anymore because I already know it off the top of my head because now it's a habit and it's, you know, regular knowledge. So yeah. <sighs> that was a mouthful. And we still talking about iron. <laughs> so um, where we at? Iron burns with a gold. So I thought this was so cool too. So iron bo- burns with a gold color in flames. So when you set something on fire, if it has like a bright, like, you know, golden flare to it, it probably has iron in it. And because of that, Iron is in fireworks. So the stuff that makes fireworks spark and is iron. Okay. And then you get the different colors from heating the iron to different temperatures. So the hotter it gets, you might get like a reddish color. The if it's cooler than normal, you might get the blues. And then it's somewhere in between there, some greens pop in. And then, you know, when it's, you know, certain, like, uh, different when you get the golds and the, the oranges and yellow. So, iron. See how? It, and that's because of those oxidation states. Mm. See? The more, the, the, the wider the range. See, that oxidation state range, that's what really be giving these transition metals all of that, that leeway. And then the wider that range, the more stuff they can do. And I love that. I love that about them. That's why this is probably going to be, like, one of my most favorite, like, topics to go over is the transition metals. I did like the halogens, but I would say transition metals are probably my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> so... Now, cobalt. So, cobalt was first isolated by Swedish chemist George Brandt. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's not how you pronounce that. I'm not Swedish, and I'm not going to attempt a Swedish accent to to pronounce that man's name. And he proved that the color in um, the blue tinted glass that uh, people thought bismuth gave it that color, he proved that it was actually cobalt that gave it that color. So I don't know if you've ever heard this term before, but cobalt blue, that's why they call it cobalt blue because cobalt blue is actually a very brilliant, bright blue color. Like almost like the little, the little, what's that? A a kangaroo that she talking to. It's almost that color. It's probably like a little bit more vibrant or no, that might, that might actually be the blue, but yeah, that's why they call it cobalt blue. And so uh, German miners, this was this was cute. And it made me think like I, I automatically went to my little my gamer reference. So German miners named uh, named the ore after mischievous spirits called kobolds. So I play Final Fantasy and there's these little like little furry like mole rat like, I don't know, gerbil looking monsters that are called kobolds. I didn't know that, <laughs> that they just repurposed the name that like somebody, you know, some other culture is superstition or whatever. And, you know, threw it in the game and gave it a, you know, and gave it a face. So <laughs> go figure. Knew about the cobalt the whole time. Didn't know what they were. <laughs> Thought it was just somebody's imagination. Because I shall be wondering, I'm like, how did they be coming up with these names for the stuff in these games? There you go. <laughs> so copper, nickel and arsenic um, are usually found in cobalt ores as well. So when they were trying to initially, you know, smelt this stuff, they were getting arsenic oxides, which is toxic, very, very toxic. So um, I'm I'm glad that they figured that out now. So um, it was probably like a ton of people that, you know, were dying or getting sick and didn't know why. Well, that's why. But uh, bismuth is also found in, um, along with cobalt uh, as well, usually. So that's why they assume that bismuth was the reason why the glass was blue, but it was actually because of the cobalt. So the isotope cobalt 60 is uh, cobalt. See, I'm, I'm, talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about the little creature. Cobalt 60 is a strong gamma radiation source. Now, gamma radiation is 
is bad. Like we like the Hulk. Yeah, I know people automatically thought like Incredible Hulk. Yes, an Incredible Hulk was made from gamma radiation, but that is extremely, extremely fictional because if your body got bombarded with a bunch of gamma ray particles, you would probably fall apart on the, on the cellular molecular level like before you got like superpowers when when you know super strong and and you know invincible practically when you got mad like no nah. <laughs> it doesn't work like that in the real world so uh gamma radiation can be stopped by like really really thick layers of like steel or iron or something like that but um it passes completely through every cell in your body nothing in your body will stop it um so that's why gamma radiation is like the worst type of radiation and um yeah uh, we we avoid that. So like if there's something that gives off gamma radiation, they have the uh what do they call those meters? Now I gotta look it up because I was I like I was just about to say it and then my mom was like, Nope. <laughs> Let's see, radiation detectors are called geigomiters, right? Yes, Geiger counters. So that's why they use Geiger counters, especially, and they and they did this a ton when they were doing all of the nuclear bomb testing and stuff like that. They had to use Geiger counters to, uh, you know, find the fallout radius and find out, you know, how strong the radiation was, um, you know, the distance from the blast and all that. And then also how long the half-life of that radiation in those um, areas lasted, because now you got to figure out, like, how long before, you know, people and stuff can be in that area without getting radiation poisoning. Y'all. So, back to our radioactive cobalt. <laughs> it's not radioactive. Um, cobalt is the central atom in vitamin B12. See, there's our transition metal again, making this appearance in our body and something super duper important. Our bodies do not make vitamin B12. We have to ingest it, okay? Vitamin B12 is another one of those essentials that you got to just eat, all right? You just got to eat it. And um, cobalt is ferromagnetic, meaning... It, if you take a iron magnet, it will, you know, jump on the magnet. That's what ferromagnetic means. Um, and it remains magnetic at temperatures higher than any other element. So that's a pretty cool um, property. And I'm assuming that's also why they like to include it in certain metal alloys, especially when magnetic properties are important at high temperatures. I'm not sure when that's uh, like a particular uh, application, but I'm pretty sure they're doing something with that. <laughs> um, it has a zero to plus five oxidation state, and its most common oxidation state is plus two or plus three. So, like when I was doing my, you know, chemistry math, because you know, chemistry math just want to be difficult. Um, <laughs> when I was doing the, especially like with redox reactions, so oxidation reduction reactions you have to know the oxidation states of everything involved. And so, like I said, these transition metals, you usually didn't know what their uh, oxidation state was until you, you know, went through the oxidation states of everything else around it. And then you were able to determine, oh, okay, that's why you need three of these and six of those and, you know, all of that. So, yeah, it, it can get complicated, but that was fun. I like that. It was fun. We had charts and stuff that showed us the possible oxidation states, and then we had to work through, you know, the logic, and yeah. The oldest cobalt colored glass was found in Egypt, dated 1550 to 1292 BC, and cobalt is used in alloys to increase temperature stability and decrease corrosion. So temperature stability just means that the metal doesn't uh, bend or break or lose its, you know, its form uh, at higher temperatures. So, yeah. So now on to rhodium. So rhodium was dis discovered by William Wollaston in 1803, between 1803 and 1804. I guess they don't they don't really know, but they know. <laughs> they have an guesstimate at when, I guess. <laughs> and um in England. And uh rhodium, and I thought this was so cute. So rhodium's name is actually uh Greek 
Rodon, meaning rose, and it actually refers to the rosy colored um, solutions that Rodon makes when it's dissolved. So, um, yeah, the salt, the salt, you know, so most of it, like your transition metals are either going to make a salt or an oxide. So when this salt is dissolved, it makes a rosy colored solution. And um, this made me think of when we did uh, an experiment where we had varying concentrations. And I believe it was rhodium that we actually used. Don't quote me on that. It's been like almost 20 years. Not not that long. How, girl, how old am I? Like, <laughs> it's been like 13 years. We'll, we'll say that in there. Yeah, somewhere in there. It's been in that time frame. Um, so it might have been rhodium, but it was definitely a colored uh, solution. And then we just, uh, we started off with a very, very concentrated um, solution. And it was like a bright, like reddish, pinkish color. And then we took like a dropper and we dropped like a, uh, like, one milliliter and, and all the beakers had the same amount of water in them. And um, we just dropped different amounts of the, you know, of the concentrated solution into these beakers. So let's say each beaker had a hundred mils of water. And, you know, we dropped one mil in one beaker, two mil in another beaker, three, and then so on and so forth. I think we did like 10 of those. <sighs> we did a lot. Yeah, it was probably like 10. And then we had to use what was called a spectrophotometer to determine the absorbance of the light in each of these solutions. And then using the absorbance ratio, we had to determine the exact concentration of each substance in the solution. <laughs> That's like that. Yeah, that was one of those. And and I definitely got a headache writing that uh, lab report up because I'm remembering now. My brain was like, why are you like, I, I, I think I like triggered some trauma or something. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember having to do that lab report. That was that was not fun math. It was a fun lab, but the math, uh, not so much. And. um, Oh, yeah. And so. uh. The alloying agent, um, rhodium, is used to harden platinum and palladium, and it has a higher melting point and lower density than platinum. So uh, that makes it an ideal, you know, cohort in this alloy situation, especially with platinum. So when you get really, really hard platinum, it's probably some rhodium in it. Um, it has low electrical resistance, so it lends itself to being an electrical contact material. So when you have a, a substance that has low electrical resistance, it means that it's not going to stop the flow of electricity as much. So like copper like is a very good electrical conductor, but it has really high resistance. So copper wires tend to get hot, like really, really hot, really hot. <laughs> and so if you're putting trying to put a lot of electricity through copper wires you could eventually melt them because they would get so hot from the the resistance that's caused and then also if it's something that you need a quick pickup signal or you know a quick response to um resistance slows that response time down because it's slowing the travel of the electricity down the substance so rhodium has very little um electrical resistance so you know that's where you're getting like quick speeds is going and you don't have feedback and all of that. You don't have hot wires and stuff hanging out everywhere. So, you know, that, that is a very useful component in, um, and stuff. And plated rhodium is very hard and has a high reflectance, making it useful in optical instruments for jewelry. So optical instruments basically means the ones where they, where they put the little it's some rhodium in that glass there, okay? And that's what, you know, they're looking at that and that's how they see the luster and they can see the inclusions and the impurities and all that stuff in your diamonds and tell you if you got suckered uh, <laughs> from somebody telling you like that that was a really good diamond. You're like, nah, it's not. <laughs> so we're on to our last one. Oh, look, perfect time wrap it up. Okay. And this one doesn't have much because this is 
um, the first fake element. <laughs> okay. I'm going to call it the first fake element. Okay. Because this is not a naturally occurring element. So technetium, technetium, who knows, um, was actually mislabeled as mercurium when it was found because in order to make this element, um, what is this? Molybdenum is bombarded with neutrons. And then, you know, so when you have a radio, cause this thing is, it's radioactive. Yeah. It's radioactive. So when you have a radioactive substance, that means that they are, you know, it's releasing particles like photons. So photons are basically neutrons. So they're energy. So when you add neutrons to a substance, you actually change its nuclear makeup. So you get a different element. And when they bombarded it with neutrons, molybdenum, it made technetium. That's what I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna call it that. And, um, it was called Masurium by some other people in 1924, but in 1937, Carlo Perrier, Perrier, I'm going to say Perrier because his name is spelled like the water. <laughs> so I like the sparkling water. I like that sparkling water. And um, Emilio Segre, I guess that's his name, in Italy. So I must, we're going to say that that's his name. In Italy, in 1937. So it was some time, it was like, you know, like 13 years before they, you know, got their act together with identifying this properly. And so technikos is uh, the Greek root of tech of this name. And it means an art or technitos, which means artificial. So either you artfully created this fake substance or it's just a fake substance, artificial. <laughs> And then um, it is, like I said, the first artificially made element and some isotopes of this element are produced as uranium fission products. So fission is basically when they take like some, you know, some neutrons or some and they whack a uranium um, atom with it and knocks neutron, you know, well, other particles and stuff off of the uranium so that's what fission is and then when it does that a whole bunch of energy is released and they usually have some type of um, mechanism or you know process to collect the energy and use it for nuclear power so usually this is done in like a water tank and then that fission process is used to use to heat the water and then the water turns turbines and then boom you get electricity from it um, I guess like other stuff you know can be done with it I don't know I haven't gone through environmental science and like now that probably has been more like 20 25 years so I took environmental science in high school so, yeah, that was the last time I saw, like, environmental science up close and personal. It was very interesting at the time, but I didn't want no more of that after that. <laughs> and so, um, it has oxidation states of plus 7, plus 5, and plus 4, and it is used as a corrosion inhibitor in steel and is an excellent superconductor at 11 kelvins or below. However, when it's used in these steel alloys, it has to be used in an enclosed environment because it's radioactive. So <laughs> you're not going to be driving a car with, you know, technetium alloy steel because you could get radiation poisoning from it. So they're not doing that. They probably might use it in like, I don't know, some other type of nuclear application where they need like the radiation to, you know, track particles from something. Who knows? Who knows? I'm not that deep in that. OK, I'm not I'm not in them trenches. All right. <laughs> and then uh, tech tech nine nine is technetium. That's another isotope. Tech nine nine is used in many medical radioactive isotope tests. So um, a lot of times when radiation is used in medicine, it's usually used for cancer ident cancer cell identification because uh, different types, you know, of cancer cells, like in different organs, like the cells in different organs are basically different cancer cell types because, you know, a liver cell is not a kidney cell. 
and you know a heart cell is not a lung cell so they use different types of radiation to determine you know cancer cells in those different organs so they probably wouldn't use the same um type of radiation um isotope to you know mark for colon cancer as they would for breast cancer you know I don't know, not a doctor. This is all speculation from my understanding of body organs and radiation, okay? <laughs> it's definitely something that if you want to research further on your own, I I highly suggest it cuz trust me, I mean look this is what I do. I just spend spend random time like my brain has a thought and I'm like, is that it? Well, what if it Okay, well, let me see. And then I'm going, I'm reading uh, papers and I'm all up in scientific journals. And then before I know it, I'm, you know, reading how uh, the the 2-1 uh, cyclohexadane uh, enzyme is affected. But like, I'm just, it, it, it it's a rabbit hole. Okay, so <laughs> be careful. <laughs> but that is all I got for y'all today. Let me make sure for... So I can give y'all a heads up on what we're talking about next week. So we will be covering next week uh, ruthenium. I believe that is. I'm not even going to uh, try and try and pretend I know what what that was. See, when you can't read your own notes, <laughs> that ever happened to you? Write something down. You go ahead like, what is? Yeah. So I'm not even going to attempt uh, to read what that one is. Um, osmium, iridium, nickel palladium and platinum so we've been kind of mentioning palladium and platinum like on and off especially when we're talking about these alloys so we're going to get into the nitty and the gritty with them next week and uh some more transition metals i think we got like two more weeks of this yep so next week and then the week after it will be the last uh transition metals and then we're gonna get into a different topic so I was thinking about heading towards like cell biology and genetics or something like that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. What we'll see what's what, what you know, what what comes to me, you know, if how I'm inspired, because you know, it's a it's a whole lot to talk about. We got a lot. We got a lot. So don't worry. <laughs> we're gonna cover we're gonna cover something useful. Cause we always do that. And then uh before we get out of here, so of course. We got Rock True Beats next at uh, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. So definitely tune in for that. Um, I will be co-hosting that one, guest hosting uh, with yours truly, Chris Lyon, Marley King. He popped in and said hi earlier. Um, he is the Rock True Beats host, and um, I'll be filling in on that one today as well. And um, I'm super excited about this announcement, y'all. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, I don't know if y'all watch Rock Truth Cafe live on Saturdays where I'm, you know, whipping it up in the kitchen. But if those recipes make your mouth water, I for sure know this food right here going to make your mouth water. And guess what? You can go and buy it now. Boom. Okay. We are soft open now at in the cup restaurant thank you thank you so much king for allowing us to share that space with you and um you can find both because in uh we actually featured in the cup on rock true queens last week and um and the collab lab that opened up across the street by the same owner he he is uh basically the one that is funding uh the space he locked the space down and gave it back to the community like y'all you know y'all y'all this y'all space so you know i love seeing stuff like that and he has his restaurant open across the street in the cup where he puts deliciousness for you okay in the cup he does have vegan and vegetarian recipes so he will cater to you whatever your mouth desires all right he gonna whip it up for you and uh okay we on the side there yep right behind the same counter rock truth cafe now has a physical home where you can go and get you some lawfully healthy cuisine choices deliciousness to feed your body and your soul okay i heard them wraps been going crazy the uh the pico bowls i really want to i really want to uh 
get in there and try some of that. I'm in Ohio, so I can't just pull up on you, but trust and believe. When I got to pass by y'all to get to Chicago. So trust and believe when I do make that trip to Chicago, I am I am stopping, all right? <laughs> I might even throw some gloves on and help y'all wrap some wrap some up, okay? If you need some extra hands on deck, I might come and be some fill-in hands for the day and then, you know, and then get me an order too to go. So smoothies, fruit bowls, rock true wraps. It's a wonderful menu. Um, I love, I love the names and the wording of the menu and all of that stuff. It's, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a rock true experience. Okay. And it's nothing but good vibes in there. It is community collaboration, customer service. Okay. All the cook, 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 cause you can, you can handle. All right. <laughs> so make sure you go and, and, and check them both out. They, they, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a, I love food. Okay. I love food and especially when it's healthy. Oh yes. Oh yes. So that's all for today. Um, make sure y'all tune in to all of our other shows. We have Rock Single, Battle of the Wills tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, Central, 7 p.m. Eastern. Rock True Queens on Thursday at 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern time. And then we have Rock True North on Friday, our our flagship. Uh, same, same time it's been since we started. Okay. 5 PM central, 6 PM Eastern. And then, uh, Saturday we have rock truth cafe live at noon PM, uh, central 1 PM Eastern. And, um, what, what's the recipe we're doing? I think we're doing the waffles. Yeah. We're doing pumpkin spice waffles and pomegranate maple syrup and a uh, sweet potato hash. Oh, that's going to. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that's gonna smack because I made that before already. So don't worry, I'm I'm just recycling a recipe that I already cooked for myself, <laughs> so I know it's good. All right, <laughs> and uh, the all of October actually is a uh, squash based recipes in um in you know in honor of our fall season. So we've already had our fall equinox on the 22nd. The season has changed. So we got to change what we eat to eat our seasonal fruits and vegetables. So pomegranate is in season. Cranberries are in season. So you might be able to start finding some fresh cranberries on the shelves again. You can make you some fresh cranberry juice, cranberry compote, cranberry relish, cranberry jelly. Okay. I, I put cranberries in, in and on everything. And they're very easy to, uh, to cook with because, you know, you can just boil some on the side or whatever it is you're doing. And then once you hear them start to crack, you know, pop open, you know, they done. And then you can mash them up from there or blend them or do whatever. Once you boil them up, you can do pretty much everything, any and everything with them. And, um, what do we got? Monday, Monday. Yes. Monday. We got Rocky, Rock Truth, Rock Youth, Rock Truth. Okay. With Jate and Tamoy's. Yeah. I love Jate. She's sitting there. Look, <laughs> I would bring you in, but you look like you look like you. <laughs> Lee, you were clanning. Go ahead. Go ahead. Say hi. Go ahead. Say hi for the tape. <laughs> hey, y'all. Look, am I in? Am I in? Yeah, you in here? <laughs> so that's our one of our Rock You Rock Truth hosts and our other host is Samoya Bryant. So definitely tune in for that. And then tonight, okay, so always come back on your Tuesdays. All right, y'all. So as usual, every day, all day, Rock Truth. 